Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I don't understand. What I want to do, I don't practice. What I hate, I end up doing. If then I do what I don't want, I'm agreeing that God's law is good. But now it's no longer I who does it, but it is sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, Nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good I don't find. The good that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil that I will not to do, I find myself practicing. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who who am doing it, but it's sin that dwells in me. I find then that there is a law. Evil is present with me even when I am willing to do good. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members. Warning warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin which is in my members. Verse 24. This is the crux and the summary of the whole matter. O wretched evil man that I am, who will deliver me From the body of this death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God. But the flesh is under the law of sin. Now to understand this passage, I've got to give you a little bit of background on the book of Romans, and where Paul has been taking this conversation so that we can understand this passage within its context. But we can also see Paul in Romans 7 is transitioning into a whole other subject that he's getting ready to take us into in Romans chapter 8. So Romans, the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul had done three missionary journeys and he had went all over Turkey and Greece and um, the, 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 the area of Asia Minor, Middle East. He had covered that area in his missionary activity and he had started churches. He went to hub cities like Thessalonica and Ephesus and Corinth, cities that were on the water where there was a lot of trade and Paul established churches in those places and had established them there because he knew with all of the movement of soldiers and trade that came in there that when people were one to Christ in those cities, they were going to be scattered all across the Roman Empire. And so his vision was to saturate the known world of the Roman Empire with the gospel. And so he was he was doing that in each of his missionary journeys. And you can kind of look as you look in those maps in the back of your Bible and see how the Apostle Paul had done that. Well, Paul had covered the, 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 the area from really Greece all the way to Israel. He'd covered most of that with missionary activity. And we find out when we read the book of Romans what Paul's purpose is. At the end of the book he says, I want to take the gospel to Spain. What was the farthest known point that he knew about? He wanted to establish a hub for the gospel all the way on the other side of Europe. 
But Paul had been ministering as a missionary out of the church at Antioch. After the church had been persecuted and scattered from Jerusalem, the hub of the church went from Jerusalem to Antioch. And you see that Antioch, the church, actually sent Paul and Barnabas out as missionaries from that church and he was going out and every time after he went out and did his missions work, he came back home at the end of the journey and told what great things God had done. So Paul had been doing all of this ministry out of Antioch, which isn't far from Jerusalem, it's in the Middle East. But Paul knows if he's going to go a thousand miles with the gospel all the way to Spain, that's a little bit long of a trip home. There wasn't jetliners they could get on back then. That was, a, that was a journey by camel and by boat. And it was a few years to get from Spain to the Middle East. So it was some major travel. So Paul, as he plans where he's going to take the gospel next, he's, he, he decides that there is a church that he hasn't started, which has become known for their, their great fervor, their stand of faith. And it is the church at Rome. And so Paul, as he's looking for a new home base that he's going to do his missionary work out, he sends a letter to the church at Rome that had, in fact, many of the converts that he had won in Thessalonica, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi, all of those other places that he had been. There were many of those converts that lived in Rome and were part of the church at Rome. So if you look at the last two chapters of the book of Romans, Paul greets over 60 people in that congregation. Those are people that he had won to Christ, that lived back at Rome, but he probably won them while they were in Thessalonica or Corinth or somewhere else. So even though it was in his home church, he had a lot of converts in the church at Rome. And so he goes through this long list. and there, I mean, it'd be like, you know, somebody that wasn't from this church, but they knew everybody here because of the ministry that he had. So Paul, as he's seeking to establish a new home base, he sends this letter to the church at Rome. And the book of Romans is different than any other letter Paul sends. Most of the other letters Paul sends are sent because he started a church at Corinth. And after he left and went on in his missionary journeys, they had a bunch of mess. And so he sends back a letter to correct the mess. Or a church at Philippi, he is writing um, to the church at Philippi because he had sent, um, he had established that church and he's sending a letter back to just encourage them. So you see those are the typical New Testament letters. These epistles of the Apostle Paul are letters that he had to the church. But the church at Rome was a completely different kind of letter because instead of Paul sending a letter there to correct a bunch of problems, to the church at Rome, he's sending a letter to introduce himself. He knows a lot of the folks that are there, but he's sending a letter to say this is the gospel that I preach. And he sends this letter as an introduction to his preaching, what he believes, and it is like a theological resume that the Apostle Paul sends to this church and says, hey, I'm coming to Rome and I want to work together with you to take the gospel to Spain. And so he sends this letter, and this letter is... One of the most amazing letters. If, 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 if you have to pick one book of the Bible to know, the book of Romans, I think, may be the most important because in the book of Romans, you have the Apostle Paul summarizing everything important from Scripture. Amen. He takes all of the major teachings from the book of Genesis through the death, resurrection of Christ and the outworking of the Holy Spirit in our lives and he summarizes it in 16 chapters, really 15, because his last uh, chapter is just say hey to so and so and tell, greet this one and that one and, 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 and send this one my, my greetings and love. So really in 15 chapters, he summarizes the whole Bible. So if you get the book of Romans, you have the cliff notes on all of Scripture. You know, when I, I, I was in school, I, there, there was a lot of books that I was supposed to read in high school. Well, I read a lot of cliff notes. I read a little summary that says, okay, here's what's important from this book. 
And you, you get the, the important highlights, but you don't have to read the whole thing. Well, that's what Romans really does. It summarizes the whole thing. So let me give you an overview of Romans so you can understand where Romans 7 falls in the teaching of the book of Romans. And at some point, we may do a teaching through the book of Romans, but i got to tell you, if we go through the whole book of Romans, it's probably 18 months. It takes a while for me to get through the book of Romans. So when we announce that series, you're going to have to just strap in for a while because we won't be getting out of that one for, for, a, for a long haul. So let me give you the highlights of Romans, which is the highlights of the whole Bible. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul lays out the theme of the book of Romans and he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. And Paul is laying out that what he's going to describe in this book is the gospel that is God's power to save lost people. In Romans chapter 1, Paul lays out for us that everyone that never hears about Jesus is still guilty before God because even though they may not have heard Jesus preach from a pulpit, they hear the truth of God from creation that's around them. And Paul says, they knew. Even if you never hear a sermon from a pulpit, if you never, are, you never see a page of Scripture... Paul says, you look out at the heavens and you see there is a God and that He is powerful. And he says that it is that suppression and denial of the truth of God that's around us that is the original sin for all of us. That we knew God, but we didn't glorify Him as God. That is the condemnation of everyone that never hears. It's scary, really, when we think about it, the need to be missionaries and light, that people that never hear will still be guilty because we really all know. Helen Keller, after Ann Sullivan um, taught her to communicate and taught her language, Ann Sullivan was a Christian and she shared with her the gospel, told her about the Lord. And Ann Sullivan, who, since she was but a toddler, had not been able to speak, had not been able to see, had not been able to hear. When her teacher told her about Jesus, she said, I knew Him, but I didn't know His name. Wow. That's the truth of God that's around us. So... Romans chapter 2, Paul then goes on and says, okay, he's already said everybody that doesn't hear is guilty of sin. In Romans chapter 2, what Paul does is he says, everybody that does know the truth is guilty. Because just because you know the law of God doesn't make you right with God. He said, we've all got this problem. You might know the law, but you don't keep it. So the religious are just as guilty as the heathen. And then in Romans chapter 3, Paul goes on and says, the, the real problem of mankind is that we are all born into a state of sin. We inherit sin from the federal head of the human race, Adam. When he sinned, he took us all into war with God. Just think of it this way. Right now, the federal head of the United States has made a treaty with Iran. Iran is testing missiles and developing nukes. They said, we're going to blow Israel off the map. So even though all of us may say, we love Israel, our federal head has said, America is an enemy of Israel. And whether or not we want to be we are under that federal head that has put us on the wrong side of God's blessings. Adam did the same. Paul goes on and tells us how it is that sinful nature that's born into us that comes from that original sin. 
So Adam didn't just declare war with God. Adam took us all into this place where we are under the bondage of sin. Romans chapter 4, Paul goes into, there's only one way to get right with God. And he uses an illustration of David. David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. There's only one way to be right with God. And that's through faith. Believe in God. We're never going to work and earn and be good enough and be perfect enough and be holy enough. We're never going to pray enough, give enough, work enough, pray enough, come to church enough, give enough, teach enough, do all of the stuff enough to be right with God. There's only one way to be right with God. Jesus said, if you want to do the work of God, believe on Him whom God has sent. There's only one way to be right with God. And that is to say, I put my faith in You, Lord. And to trust in Him. And that the cross is enough. Paul goes from Romans 4 to Romans 5 and says, Abraham is another example. Abraham believed God. And God said He is counted as righteous. God declared Abraham as righteous not because of what he did. Amen. Not because he took Isaac up to the altar and was going to sacrifice him. That came decades later. But the Scripture says, God told Abraham, your descendants are going to be as many as the stars of the heaven. As many as the sand of the sea. And that Abraham believed God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. If we're working to be good enough, it's just another religion. But if we are believing on the cross and believing that with faith that God said that He will justify the sinner and the ungodly and that even though our sins are as scarlet, He'll make them as white as snow. That then we can be right with God and it's only by faith. In Romans 6, Paul goes on. And he talks about this ultimate sin problem and says that the wages of sin is death. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He summarizes the first six chapters and says, we've all got a sin problem. And there's only one fix for it. And that is the gift of God. Grace through Jesus. Is the only cure for our sin problem. So Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that this is the way that we are made right with God. It's the same as with David, same as with Abraham. It's the same for us today. And it is the grace of God and faith in His goodness that gets us right with God. Now Paul, in Romans chapter 7, deals with the struggle of now that we have been made right with God. There is a struggle that goes on. Because we still have a body and a sin nature. And we still have a mind that is under bondage and under the chains of sin. But there's also now, instead of that being the only reality in us, You didn't struggle with sin before you got saved. You enjoyed it. Now that you're saved, there's a struggle. And that's where we are in Romans chapter 7. And Paul talks about the struggle and he says, the things I want to do, I don't do. I set my alarm and get up at 5 a.m. so I can have time to pray. And then I fall asleep while I'm praying. To stay up with a Bible in my lap and try to read. And doze off while I'm reading. I set a resolution that I'm going to start witnessing. The struggle. The struggle that's in us. Paul says, I want to do this, but I find myself doing that. I don't want to do this, and I end up doing it. See, Paul here, he's, he's, he's way, way more transparent 
Most of us are in church. We don't want to admit it's still a struggle. We want to act like we got it all down. We're going, to, we're going to start to unwrap this thing in just a minute. But, but, but this is where Paul is at. He's talked about how we're made right with God. And the se- chapter 7 is that in between, God has declared us as forgiven. We're washed in the blood of Jesus, but we still struggle with sin. Now in Romans chapter 8, he's going to start unpacking for us the life in the Spirit. And He's going to start talking to us about the power of the Holy Spirit in our life and what the Holy Spirit does to help us to be victorious over these sin problems and the, and the awesomeness of the Holy Spirit that even prays and intercedes with groanings that can't be uttered and the Spirit that is in us that's yearning for the kingdom to come. And He talks about all that. But in this verse here, Romans chapter 7, verse 24, Paul says... Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? This is why you got to study the Bible, because if you just read it, there's a whole lot of nuggets there that you might miss. <clears throat> the body of death was actually... From around 400 AD to about 200, or 400 BC to 200 AD, was a form of execution that a really sadistic king came up with. And it was a form of execution that was only for murderers. And if you murdered somebody, the body of death punishment is they would take that corpse that you had murdered and they would chain it to your body. And you had to carry around the corpse, the body of death. And that corpse began to decay. And the rot of the corpse that you were carrying would begin to infect your living flesh. And the rot of the corpse would eat away at you until you fell underneath its weight and your own body while living was dying and decaying in this form of execution. It's pretty disgusting. But Paul uses that as an image for what it's like when you're saved but you're carrying around a sinful nature that's trying to eat away at the life that God has placed in us. Paul said, oh, he's he's frustrated with his sinful nature. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to unstrap and unchain this corpse? Of this sinful nature that I'm carrying. So for us to really understand our sin problem, we have to understand ourselves. Now we know some things about ourselves. First, core of who we are is a spirit. The Spirit, Proverbs says, comes from God. You remember Adam, God formed him from the dust. And the Bible says that God breathed into him. The word for breath and spirit are the same. Anywhere you see in the Old Testament, breath. And spirit, it's the same. It's the same word in the original language. So they just translate based on what the passage seems to be meaning, but where it says, let everything that hath breath, it's the same word, let everything that has spirit. Let everything that hath breath. We have breath 
Because God breathed into us. We continue to have breath because of God's gift to us. Let everything that hath breath, I often say, that if you inhale God's air, you ought to exhale God's praise. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. The Spirit is that part of us that comes from God that is eternal. The soul. The soul of man is the second part of who we are. Our soul is our mind, our emotions, our heart, our will, our desires. Our soul. Our soul is a spiritual part of us because it's not something that you can touch and see. But our soul is influenced by what is around us and oftentimes by our own weaknesses, our own sinful tendencies, our soul, our body. Anybody know what our body is? It's that physical part that we can see. Our body is that part that comes from the dust of the earth. It's our temporary house. And because of the effects of sin, the body that we're in now dies. Now, the Lord's going to take care of that in the end of our salvation. But our body is our physical part. So sin, just like we have three parts, we're body, soul, and spirit, sin is multidimensional. Sin, at its most basic element, we all recognize sinful acts. There's two act types of acts of sin. The acts of sin could be sins that you commit, So if you steal, if you kill, if you commit adultery, those are acts that you commit. That's sins that you do. But there are also sinful acts that are things you should have done but didn't do. James says to him that knows to do good and does it not, it is sin. So there, 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 there are sinful acts. And, 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 and typically when we're in church and we're talking about sin, everybody focuses on the sinful acts. It's the stuff that you should have done that you didn't do. Or the stuff that... The opposite of that. Sinful acts. But Jesus actually kind of turn to that notion upside down because sinful acts are really just the symptom. It's not the disease. The sinful acts, you can clean those up just because you become religious but never have any real change. And Jesus, he, he kind of rocked people's world that thought, man, we're doing really good. We're keeping all the commandments. We, we haven't done any of those top ten sins. And Jesus said, hey, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. I'm going to tell you, if you hate your brother, Amen. you're guilty of murder. Amen. And then Jesus goes on and says, Hey, you, you, you think you're doing good because it says don't commit adultery and you never committed adultery? Jesus said, well, you've already went there in your heart and in your mind. You need to clean that up. See, we focus on the sinful acts thinking if we can get people to stop doing that. But it doesn't fix the disease. The sinful acts are the symptom. And if you just deal with the symptoms and not the disease, guess what happens? You trade the sin of cussing, which was an anger issue that you needed to get the Lord to help you to take care of. But because you're in church, you can't be cussing so much. Everybody's wondering why, you know, what 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 are you doing? You you're here praising the Lord, and then you go out and you get all mad and you start cussing somebody. 
Well, you learn after a while that the church don't accept that kind of behavior. So you don't get the anger taken care of. You take care of the sinful acts, not the sinful nature. And you stop cussing, but you start gossiping. Amen. Backbiting. You didn't fix the problem. You just tinkered around with the symptom. Sinful acts. Paul said, because there's more that there's more that we have to take care of. And 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 if you just take care of the sinful acts, you've just become religious. Now it's better. I've got to tell you, if you quit murdering, that's that's a better thing, right? Somebody get up and testify. I haven't murdered anybody for a whole week. Thank the Lord. I am doing good on these commandments. But we got to take care of the sinful nature. Sinful acts are the symptoms, but sinful nature is the true core of why you sin. You don't commit sins. You're not a sinner because you commit sins. You sin because you're a sinner. The sinful nature is the disease. And we are, te- we are dealing with in church oftentimes just the sinful acts. Try to get somebody to just quit the sinful acts. If we can just get somebody to stop doing this. But in reality, it's not enough to just stop the sinful acts. We need to address and understand the sinful nature. The sinful nature. It is the nature that we're born with. Now all of us are created in the image of God. There is something of an imprint of God in every person that is beautiful, that draws us toward the Lord. But because we're all born into sin... We not only have the image of God in us, we have a sinful nature. I got to tell you, you don't have to teach a kid how to be selfish. I didn't teach any of mine how to be selfish. I've got a lot of them. I've got a lot of first-hand experience watching this. They all learn to say, Mine! You don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't sit down with them and say, now here's how you lie. First time they're old enough to realize I'm in trouble, and if I say something different about what I did than what's true, I might get out of it. You don't learn to lie from your environment. It's in your sinful nature. If we don't understand the sinful nature, we think the problem with sin is stuff around us. We think it's the environment. I, I, I'll use this example because it's been in plenty of news coverage and media coverage. I think that the Duggar family tries and has done the best they can at instilling Christian principles and values in their kids. You look at some of the things they talk about, they don't let their kids on the internet unless somebody else is in the room. I mean, they've got all these strict... They don't let their kids out on dates without chaperones. They are very controlled about what they allow their kids to watch. All of that's good. And we have to do that. Right? To be responsible and not to pollute young innocent minds with all the corruption that's out there because there's plenty of poison that the enemy wants to put inside of our our, our young people and our kids and we've got to do our best to protect them. But Josh Duggar's key problem wasn't sin that was around him. Real problem was sin that's in him. Sin that's in me. My biggest struggle is not the devil. It's that guy I look down in the mirror 
and all of his problems. See, there have been monks that thought if they would go out and build a monastery where they could pray and it was out in the middle of the desert or on a mountain and there's no people around, there's no temptation around, that they could overcome sin. They found out that it wasn't the sin around them. It was the sin in them. Amen. That's the challenge. And Paul in Romans 7 is wrestling with that and saying, Oh, wretched man that I am! Now this is an apostle who has done missionary journeys, who has seen people raised from the dead, who has been persecuted, who has been stoned and left for dead, a man that has seen Jesus, a man that has had visions, a man that has written Scripture. And with all of that, he says, I'm struggling with this sin nature of mine. I think if we're all honest. See those sinful acts. You can lick those. You can stop doing this. You can stop the cussing. How do you deal with that anger problem? He can stop the drinking. How do you deal with that depression? He can stop the adulterating. How do you turn off those thoughts? Paul said, this, this, this is the struggle. This is that in-between struggle. God's forgiven you. You've been made right with God. God has done great things in your life. And you know that you have been born again. But you're wrestling the sin nature. And he lays out that chapter. The whole of chapter 7 is about that struggle. He goes through the struggle in in great detail and lets you feel the tension that he feels between the two worlds. <clears throat> and we won't get to it to th- this week. But there is yet another part of the grace of God that helps us to overcome our sinful nature. That's what we're going to look at next week. Well, let me talk about the last aspect of sin that we'll we'll, we'll end with this week. That is our sinful estate. Our sinful estate is our position of sinfulness. When we are outside of God's grace, before we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are in a state that is at war with God. Positionally, we are on the opposite side of the eternal war of God against the rebellion against Him. We are in a position of sinfulness. Now that we have put our faith in Christ, and we, Paul says we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His marvelous light. Spiritually, we are no longer at war with God. But, we live in a world that is at war with God. And this is, you know, sometimes when you, when you see the beauty of nature and the beauty of creation that's all around us, It's hard to imagine this, but just as the image of God in us has been marred by sin, so has creation. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that this whole of creation has been subject to sin. Not willingly, but by the one that God placed in authority over it. That's man. 
So the beauty that we see around us is crippled because of sin. It's scarred. It's wounded. And all of creation that was created to emanate with the glory of God is longing for its full redemption. And we live in this in-between state where we're wrestling with our sinful nature. We're dealing with our surrendering ourselves to the grace of God to change us, to transform us. And we live in a world hurt by sin. You realize... That if sin wasn't affecting the environment that we live in, there would be no death. There would be no sickness. You know, sometimes folks look at tragedies and things that happen that are unexplainable, horrible. And they say, why did God let this happen? But the way God created things, it didn't happen. It is not an individual. Don't, don't, don't take this the wrong way and think that if somebody is sick that it's because they sinned. It's that our race has sinned. The human race. That our planet is marred by that sinfulness. And sin is having an escalating effect. And you see people bury in sorrow, grief in hospitals. God designed things to live, not die. To heal, not be sick. He designed us where there was a tree of life. There was a tree that had leaves for the healing of the nation. Perfect. And when we look at and we see tragedies and natural disasters and sickness, it's not God that wanted this, it this way. It's our rebellion that broke everything and created the suffering in our sinful state. Now next week we're going to look at everything that Jesus did in our redemption and our salvation addresses all of these. He doesn't just deal with our sinful acts, but there is grace and power for our sinful nature and there is full redemption for us from our sinful estate. That so much so that God is not going to leave in those that put their faith in Him anything lost and devastated by the power of sin. But everything in His time and in His purpose will be fully redeemed and made right. By His grace. We don't have time for that tonight. I'll keep, I'd keep you all here till Wait, wait, way too late. Way past when you, when you quit, quit listening. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that next week. But as we look at this, I want you to understand that God's grace is powerful enough to handle who we are and our sin problem. We start to think that the sins that we have inherited. You know, I come from a long line of addicts and alcoholics. And if it was not for the grace of God interrupting in my family tree, I've outlived almost all of my aunts and uncles. They died in their 30s. Most of them from overdoses. I preached their funeral. 
The only reason that I'm here and that there's any difference is because of the grace of God that is more powerful than depression and mental illness and addiction and alcoholism and all of that stuff that you would look at and say, it's been in our family for generations. And you could go back probably a hundred years, two hundred years, and see the same problems. But the cross of Jesus Christ planted a stop in our family tree. And it's no more. And it's not going to be for me or for my children or for my children's children because the grace of God is more powerful than all of the powers of sin. Whether it's our sinful nature, our sinful family, our sinful past, any of it, God's grace is greater. Tonight, I want you to know that God's grace is greater. Greater than what you've come from and greater than what you're struggling with. It's more powerful. And it can help you to overcome. Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, mm-hmm. who will deliver me from this body of death? Mm-hmm. He's talked about the power of Christ to forgive us, make us right with God. And now he's getting ready to tell us the good news about the power of the cross to keep us and to change us and to give us the ability to overcome even our sinful nature. He says, who will deliver me? I thank God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus said, it is finished, He said it not to just put an end to your sinful acts, but to give you grace to be powerful in Him to overthrow your sinful nature so that you can lick addiction, depression by the power of of the cross Amen. of Jesus Christ. See, we have to understand this. Because we, we have folks that come and they get forgiveness for their sinful acts. And then we as the church get frustrated with them if we don't see the change. Instead of helping them be discipled to understand the same cross that forgave you will keep you Amen. and give you victory over all of it. Just because you went to the altar once and prayed and said, well, it didn't take. Oh, just keep going down and dipping again. Just like Nathan was told told by the prophet, just dip again in the Jordan. Dip seven times. I don't care if you've got to go be baptized again, if you've got to come to the altar again, if you've got to pray through again. You just keep on. There is grace enough to give you the power to be clean and sober and free and walk in victory. Hallelujah. Bow your heads and close your eyes.